Good evening. My name is Charlie Adkins, and I'm this year's chair of the VIP Distinguished Speaker Series. The VIP Distinguished Speaker Series is one of the many programs put on by the Undergraduate Business Council for the Red McCombs School of Business. Today, we are joined by Dean David Platt, Associate Dean of McCombs Undergraduate Programs, and Mr. Thomas Horton, Chairman of American Airlines Group and American Airlines. We will begin tonight with an interview between Dean Platt and Mr. Horton. Then we will open the floor to Q&A from the audience. As a reminder, today's event will end promptly at 6 p.m. We would greatly appreciate if you could refrain from leaving early and using electronic devices. Tom Horton is chairman of the American Airlines Group and American Airlines. Prior to the merger with US Airways Group in December 2013, he was chairman, president, and chief executive officer of AMR Corporation. He also is chairman of the One World Alliance, of which American is a founding member. Horton has a long track, of, long track record of leadership and results in business. As chairman and CEO of American, he led the company through one of the most successful restructurings and turnarounds in the airline industry. The restructuring culminated in the merger with US Airways, creating the world's leading airline and unprecedented value for all stakeholders. Since joining American from Business School, Horton has held a broad range of leadership positions, including Vice President for American's International Business, based in London, and later Chief Financial Officer of American. He serves on the Board of Directors of Qualcomm Incorporated, a leading developer and innovator of advanced wireless technologies. He also serves on the executive board of the Cox School of Business at SMU. Please help me welcome Dean Platt and Mr. Horton. Thank you, Charlie. Is this on okay? Everybody here? Great. Test, can you hear me? Yeah, okay. Yeah, sounds good. Maybe just pop the mine up a little bit. There we go. Well, thank you for being with us. We thank really you for appreciate me. you spending the time. Look forward to, to learning from your experience and hearing about some of your experiences. Uh, we, tip, we traditionally start off with a question from the prior speaker, who in this case um, was Ravi Salagram, who was the former CEO of Office Max. And so I have his question here. I'll read it to you and uh, give you a chance to respond. Uh, so Mr. Salagram said, uh, he, he was speaking of the merger of, of American Airways and US Air, and he said, presumably the American US Air merger was good for your shareholders. Uh, but was it good for your employees? How did you deal with the trade-off between providing value for your shareholders and the potential of people losing their jobs? Yeah, it's a good question because, of course, leading a company, you have many constituents. You have the owners of the company, you have your people, you have customer suppliers, communities, and it's always a delicate balancing act. Uh, the good news about the merger was that because American U.S. Airways had very complementary networks, there was very little overlap in, in the systems. Um, there wasn't really any redundancy in, in either the hubs or the flying or the, um, or the people. So of the 900 routes that we operate combined, we had only 11 that actually overlapped. And the byproduct of that was we didn't really have any, uh, we needed all the people, we needed all the airplanes, we needed everything. So, uh, so it was a really good outcome for our people. Where there were some redundancies, and it was pretty modest, was in the corporate staff groups. You know, you think about it, you don't need two legal departments, or two purchasing departments, two finance departments, those sorts of things. So uh, the headquarters is in Dallas, so some of the staff from US Airways headquarters in Phoenix was not, uh, not needed, but uh, overall uh, very modest. And uh, in fact, I think the, the outcome for, for the people of both companies was really quite positive. Good. Some uh, background questions about how you got where you are. So wh what, do, what do you think it is about your personality that's led to your uh, success? Um, well, I think amnesia <laughs> and the reason I say that is I actually left the airline industry and I forgot how hard it was and I came back. So um, I, I did come back to the airline industry back in, uh, back in 06. I was away for four years uh, in the telecom business uh, at AT&T. And um, uh, seriously, to answer your question, I think it's probably um, persistence, uh, stubbornness, and you know, I think early on in this restructuring, we can talk a little bit more about this later on, there were a lot of people who were, uh, I think, 
suggesting that there were a lot of naysayers. There were a lot of people who didn't think American was going to make it out of the, the restructuring early on. Our stock had become worthless. Our bonds were trading at 20 cents on the dollar. People were saying all sorts of terrible things about the company. And, you know, I didn't believe that for a second. I had spent most of my career with the company, and I viewed it as the greatest airline in the world. And, you know, in my view, what we needed to do was go level the playing field, as the other airlines had done via restructuring, uh, creating more competitive cost structure, uh, capital structure, and then capitalizing on the things that were really strong at American. Great network, you know, 900 airplanes, a great brand, the Advantage program, the, the One World Alliance, and this big aircraft order that we had done just before the restructuring started. All those things were huge assets, and in my view, if we address those things, we would make the company very successful. So I had sort of a dogged, maybe persistent belief in that. And, uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, I think people eventually, you know, got, got behind that. And that's, you know, that's where we landed. But, you know, stubbornness almost to the you know, point of dumb optimism. <laughs> in terms of your... Um your, your position now coming, coming out of the merger and coming out of the, the uh, restructuring, what are the things as chairman of the company um, that, that keep you up at night these days now that you're trying to find the way forward from here? Well, I, I don't stay up at night. I sleep pretty well. <laughs> um, but I will tell you um, that this, you know, the job of CEO, and, and I hope you know, many of you one day will, will do that job or a job of, of you know, leadership. Uh, uh, you know, it's, it's pretty all-consuming. It really does take, you know, 24-7. 24, 24 You're on the whole time. And in this industry in particular, um, you know, safety is first and last and everything in between. Um, we you know, we're not building dishwashers. We're putting people in the air. And uh, 6,700 flights a day, you know, hundreds of thousands of people putting on board our airplanes. And so you think a lot about safety. Mm -hmm. and, um, and you know that, you know, the buck stops with, with you. And um, so I, I, thought, I thought a lot about that. And, you know, you never, you, you never want to get that phone call in the middle of the night and, you know, uh, Thank the Lord I never did. And, and I just think it's important to remind yourself, and I would always remind our team, that you know, whether we think about uh, new airplanes, customer experience, in-flight video, food on airplanes, all the things that we try to do maybe better than the other guy, the most important thing we do every day is you know, get them up and get them down safely. Yeah. Yeah. So when you, when you get up safe the next morning, what's the thing that gets you up in the morning then? What's the exciting part? I like to run. So that's what okay. I do. I, I get my day started running. Uh, I usually get up about 5.30 and shoot straight out the door and, and go get in a run wherever I am uh, in the world. And I just find it's a great way to clear the head, you know, kind of level yourself for the day. Mm -hmm. I run most every day. I might skip a day here and there. But... And I do it uh, when I travel, which I think is really, really helpful. And, and I love it because I travel a lot in this job. Uh, there's nothing greater than just landing in some city you've never been to before and just shooting out the hotel door and going for a run. It's just a great way to sort of get the tempo of the city and, and uh, get a feel for the place and then, you know, then get off and take on the day. So that, that's what I do in the morning to get started. And it, so is that the, that the secret to dealing with jet lag? I, I think so, actually. Um, I'm sure all of you have traveled a lot. I, I hope you do. I hope you travel more. But um, I find that uh, long trips, I used to do the London-Dallas trip all the time because I, we lived in London. And, uh, you know, land London early in the morning. And I would always get off the plane and shoot right out to the park and go for a run. And I found that doing that, you know, great way to sort of mm -hmm. shake the jet lag and get on with the day, go to work. Yeah. I had a, this weekend, we were doing some um, recruiting events, student recruiting, actually, and trying to get some accepted students to come here and had an interesting conversation with a, a father who um, he and his daughter disagreed on this. She really wanted to do some international experience while she was here. And he kind of said, well, why, why do you need to do that? You know, you, you've traveled some with the family. Um, what are you going to get out of doing that? So I was just curious, knowing that you had been in London for a while, what you thought about the international experience and how important you feel it is toward a career. 
Oh, I think it's, I think it's invaluable. I, I think if, you know, the most important thing is what is the experience, not necessarily whether it's U.S. or international, what have you. What experience are you getting? Is it, is it real sort of work experience that's going to benefit you in the future? I would start with that. So, you know, if you told me I could go work in an engineering program at, you know, Boeing in Washington, or I could go to Salamanca and Tin Bar, I would say probably go to Washington. <laughs> um, so I think do try to do something of, of value that's, mm -hmm. that, that's you know furthering your career, but international experience is great, and uh, because it just gives you you know it sounds cool. Hey, it just gives you a different perspective on the world. We lived in London for two years. My kids actually started school over there. They were four and five at the time, and um, so we put them in the British schools. We thought, you know, what the heck is we're not going to put them in the American school system. They can do that at home. So we put them in the British schools, and they picked up funny little British accents. And, and, but they really got a great perspective. And so they have a bunch of kids from all around the world to this day who are still their friends from that time. And I think that's just really uh, it's really good experience. They have, a, yeah, they have just a little broader perspective, I think, than had they not done so, and, mm -hmm. and they've both done sort of international things since then. Okay. I've got two kids at college now. Yeah, well, that's good. So you started us off with your run in the morning. What, what's the rest of a typical day like? Well, there's, there's not really a typical day yeah. uh, in this job, and that's probably true of, of, yeah. of you, Dean, so many people. The days don't tend to, tend to be typical, but it depends on the travel schedule. So in a, in a, in a CEO job, you do travel a lot. Um, you have a whole lot of constituents, as I described a minute ago, that you're, you're, you're thinking about. You're, you're thinking about um, uh, your people, your customers, your investors, Wall Street, um, the government, uh, uh, the communities you serve, your suppliers. You've just got a whole lot of people who are important to the success of, of the company. And you know that involves, over the course of the year, spending time with them. Um, so. And of course, you have a board of directors who uh, you have to spend some time with. So I think it really starts with, um, when you're in this job, creating a, a, a kind of a governance structure, a governance timetable. So, but that one that creates a lot of flexibility. So we would, uh, at American, of course, that starts with the board meetings. You've got you know, five or six board meetings a year. Those are scheduled well in advance. Everybody knows when they are, and those tend to focus the mind on what you're going to talk about and what you're going to educate uh, the board on. Um, every week, we would get together the top team, so the CEO and the top, uh, the top 11 direct reports. We'd get in a room and uh, on Tuesday morning and spend most of the day together. And that would be a forum for you know, folks in the company would know that if we've got a big decision we need to make on aircraft configuration, that's the body you're going to bring it to, and we'll deliberate and then, you know, make a decision and move on. So we do that weekly, and everybody know they could sort of plan their week around that. Uh, every other week, we'd get together all the vice presidents down to the sort of top 50 uh, folks at the company, and uh, that would be more information sharing, make sure everybody knows what we're doing, when we're doing it, why we're doing it, so they can communicate with their, with their teams. It was a company with, at that time, 80,000 people. It's now 110,000 people. It's very important that your senior leaders know what's going on. They're well informed, and they know how to articulate that to their to their troops and down the line. So we would do that every couple of weeks, um, and then around that, you know, you would schedule uh, schedule travel to uh, you know visit uh, field operations, uh, uh, visit with the troops. Um, you know, get to Washington and make the rounds as, as necessary to advocate for things that are important to the company. Um, get out and see customers. Uh, you know, American has a lot of sort of big corporate customer accounts, and we would spend time with them and let them know that they were valued and take their input. Um, some international travel. Um, American is a leader in the One World Alliance, um, and I've served as chairman of, of that alliance, which includes British Airways, Cathay, Qantas, Japan Airlines, Lon, down in Latin America, and uh, a, a number of other airlines. It's important to sort of keep that group together. So we had a whole governance structure around managing the alliance, which was you know, a little bit of herding cats. So, um, so there were a lot of 
you know, a lot of constituents that you're, uh, it's important to, um, to pay attention to. Mm -hmm. So you have this weekly meeting and you're by nature a inter very international company. And um, so you have this Tuesday meeting, I think you said, yeah. where everybody's together. Yeah. Was that a key point in the week for everybody? Was everyone expected to be back at, yes. at headquarters for that day? Yeah, yeah, everybody would be there. Okay. And then that way you could sort of plan your, your travel schedule around mm -hmm. that and people would know, you know, you're not gonna, typically not gonna call a meeting that requires everybody to disrupt whatever plans they have. You right. know, if you've got a guy who runs the airport operations worldwide, well, you know, he might have you know, 20,000 people reporting to him. Well, he needs to kind of know how to govern his uh, part of the company uh, without having to constantly be at the beck and call of the, of the CEO. So, you, you know, you try to create something that makes sense and people okay. can work around. Balancing kind of discipline with flexibility. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So in the span of your career, was there a, a key turning point? that brought you where you are there, now. Yeah, there was a very clear clear key t turning point. Maybe this is probably unique to my company, unique to me, my career. It was 9-11. And um, uh, as some of you may recall, and you, you, you all were quite young at the time, but uh, American uh, had two of the four airplanes that were involved in the 9-11 attacks. And uh, our, uh, our Flight 11 was the first to go into the World Trade Center. And um, I was CFO of the company at the time. I was uh, you know, pretty early in my career, but um, was CFO. And you know, I, I, it would be impossible to describe what that was like. But I will tell you, it was, um, uh, you know, there's no playbook, no playbook at all for what we had to do. And our company was shut down for four days. Uh, in the wake of that, and then when we got the company back up and running, you know, all the planes were on the ground, still had to make payroll. You know, we didn't have any revenue coming in, but we still had to uh, pay our expenses. And um, and we, on the morning of 9-11, we, uh, we were in the process of launching a $2 billion bond offering, which was going to be the biggest uh, financing ever in the industry. That was our sort of financing for the days forward. We had just completed the acquisition of TWA, so it was a really complicated time for American. Needless to say, when the plane hit the tower, the f financial markets were done, the financing fell apart, we didn't get the financing, we didn't have any revenues, it was hairy. So we spent the next uh, weeks and months trying to put the company back together and, and uh, Wound up, you know, reducing capacity about 20%. We had to defer billions of dollars of new aircraft orders with Boeing because we couldn't, you know, we couldn't finance them. Uh, we had to furlough about 20% of our staff because we had shrunk the, the company down to accommodate the new lower level of aircraft air, air, airline demand in the industry. It was just a really, really unbelievable time, and so just a whole lot of triage to get the company stabilized and get it back on its feet, but. The reason I tell you that is that sort of set in motion a sort of a, a chain reaction of events that had very profound implications for a company, but also had very pro profound implications, much smaller level, for me and my career. And um, for the company, of course, it meant that, you know, a couple of years afterwards, we wound up in a consensual restructuring, not a bankruptcy like the other airlines had done, but a restructuring of our debt and our leases and our labor contracts and such, which proved not to be enough. And when the others had gone through full bankruptcies and restructurings, American fought it longer than anybody else and then back in 2011 had to, had to take that tack. But that just meant a very tumultuous decade for our company and one in which you know, we lost billions of dollars and it was just very, very hard on all of our people until we got to 2011 and then you know, did the full restructuring, did the merger, um, and, and got on with it. Uh, what it meant for me is that um, I had been recruited away in, in, uh, in 2002 to AT&T to, um, uh, to be CFO and, uh, and eventually vice chairman of the company. And um, yeah, it was a wrenching decision because I'd been an American most of my career, but we'll, in the wake of 9-11, we had sort of gotten things sorted out and it just felt like sort of a good break point to, um, uh, to, to go learn a different industry and go live somewhere else. So that's what we did. And we took that on. And I was there for four years. Culminated in the merger with SBC, creating the new AT and T, which is now based in Dallas. And uh, at that point, I came back to American and 
I came back uh, as the um, uh, head of finance, CFO, but also of marketing and planning and a lot of other things. And then um, uh, a couple years hence, became president of the company. And then when it became clear we were going to go through the restructuring, uh, my predecessor decided that was something he didn't want to he didn't want to do, and uh, we agreed upon that. He stepped aside, and I, I took the CEO job. That was back in 2011. So that's a long story, but 9/11 set into place a, a series of events that mm -hmm. sort of led to both the restructuring of the company and then the um, the role that I had to play. It's funny the paths careers take sometimes. It so is you, your experience at AT&T, I guess gave you the merger experience that you could then use when you came back to American. It did, it did, and I'll tell you, you know, it's, it's funny, you know, we all sort of plan our careers. I know all of you are busy thinking about how you want your career to go, and that's important to do, and I encourage you to be very thoughtful about it. Just recognize that, you know, God will probably have a different plan once you, once you get there. Uh, you never really know what's gonna happen, but prepare yourself for it, and prepare yourself for whatever will come, and as long as you have the right values and the right principles, you're off to the races. I'll tell you one little quick story about how uh, it came about, uh, how I got the job. I was, we were, um, you know, we had our final board meeting to make the decision to go down this restructuring track, which is a very wrenching thing to do in New York, and this was back in uh, late November of 2011. And so we had the meeting, uh, the board decided this is what we were gonna do, but we weren't gonna make the final decision and do the final board governance activities until later that night after the markets had closed. So I hopped on a plane to fly back to Dallas and uh, uh, we were gonna have a board phone call that night at 9.30. And then the next morning I had to be you know, at the headquarters to face the, face the music and face the media and the, 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 all of our people and describe what we were doing, why? So I'm in my office, and it's like 9.30 at night. I'd just gotten back from New York, and I call the, the board together on the phone, and I'm sitting in my office by myself. I've got all this paper spread out in front of me, sort of prepping for the next day. I'm looking out the window into the dark, and yeah, I've worked for this company most of my career. It's what I know. I love the company. And, and so I get the board on the, on the call, and I said, uh, okay, well, um, you know we've got uh, we've we've got uh, we've got three things to do, and and so the lead director, a guy named Normando Kodinik, says, okay, here are the three, three things we got to do. We've got to accept the retirement of Gerard Arpey, my predecessor. All in favor, aye. Okay, we've got to name Tom the chairman and CEO. All in favor, aye. And then Armando says, okay, Mr. Chairman, over to you for the third item. And I said. Okay, I need a uh, vote to put the AMR Corporation into bankruptcy. All in favor, aye. Everybody says yes, click the phone, and I'm sitting in my office thinking, oh my gosh. <laughs> in about five minutes, I've been named CEO of the company and chairman. I guess that's the good news. The bad news is we just put it in bankruptcy and, uh, you know, it's a company I love. So it was an extraordinary moment. And, and I sat there and thought about what the, the implications of that were. And uh, knowing that there were going to be some, there were going to be some rocky times ahead. But I also believed, as I said to you, all of you earlier, I strongly believed this company was going to be hugely successful. We just had to go through the, you know, we had to go through the valley of death. That's a great lead into my next question, which is what, is, what does American have to do now to, to really thrive and succeed? Well, I think Americans got all the, all the building blocks in place. And I, you know, I credit my predecessor, Gerard Arpey, a good University of Texas undergrad, an MBA, uh, one of the great, finest people you'll meet anywhere. He didn't want to go through a bankruptcy. He felt very strongly that bankruptcy was a bad thing to do, bad outcome for creditors, bad outcome for people. He didn't want to do it, and I, I was with him all the way until it was inevitable. And, but he felt very strongly about that. And uh, so back in 2010, 2011, we concluded that we were gonna go make the company successful one way or the other. We were either gonna make deals with the unions and make deals with the creditors to consensually address the challenges we had 
maybe unlikely, but we were going to try to do that. Or we were going to go do it the way the others had done it in the industry, via a, an in-court restructuring. You know, United had done it, Delta had done it, Continental had done it twice, TWA had done it three times. I mean, this was old hat in the, in the airline industry. We didn't want to do it. But we knew that one way or the other, we were going to fix the company. So we set about, under Gerard's leadership, taking some very seminal actions. We restructured our network around our five big hubs, New York, Chicago, LA, Dallas, Fort Worth, and Miami. We built out our alliances, the One World Alliance that I described to you, and we built a, a joint venture with British Airways across the Atlantic and across the Pacific with Japan Airlines. And maybe the most seminal was we went out and did uh, the biggest aircraft order in the history of the industry, 460 new jets from Boeing and Airbus, and we got those guys, we said to them, hey, you know, we, we'd like to order a ton of airplanes, we don't have any money. <laughs> so, so they brought $13 billion in manufacturer financing. So we got all of that set up and ready to go, and then we thought that would be a great catalyst with the union. So we went to the pilot's union, we said, look, we can put this company on a turbocharger, but we're gonna have to make the right sort of, um, uh, changes to the contract to have sort of next generation labor contracts like all the other guys got via bankruptcy. If we can do that, we can grow the company because we have all these airplanes on order. And that means jobs, that means advancement, and that's, that's good for, for you. Well, a very long story short, we couldn't make that deal because I think the unions politically couldn't get there. It was just, they had to get the a deal ratified while they knew changes needed to be made. Politically, they couldn't do it. They really needed the cover of a of a full restructuring. And that may sound strange, but that's just the way it was. So when they said no, our board said, okay, time out, it's time to go. Let's go do this the way others have done it. We'll, we'll make it the company successful. And, and, and that's, that was the genesis of, of the bankruptcy. But very long-winded answer to your question, Dean, which is we had a lot of the building blocks in place. So today, now we have all of those things, but we also have a competitive cost structure a very strong balance sheet, lots of cash, um, a steady stream of new airplanes and new products. So this year we'll take 100 new airplanes into our fleet. That's unheard of in the industry. So we refresh the brand. You see the new look of the American Airlines planes. Uh, we're hiring lots of new flight attendants and pilots, which has a nice sort of uh, product effect. Um, so a lot of things are being renewed, and, and then we completed the merger. So American is now, again, the largest airline in the world, and um, this year, uh, I predict, will be the most profitable airline in the world. And so I think all of those are really good. Now let's come to what must be done right. So I think the tailwind is enormous. Mm -hmm. We have to integrate these two companies successfully. American and US Airways. And integrating airlines is a very complicated business. You have to integrate the fleet, you have to integrate the workforces, uh, integrate the IT systems, and we have to do that well, and we have to do it in a way that our customers say, yeah, the merger was good. No, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't bad. And you know, we have a couple of examples of big mergers in the, in the US airline industry, United and Continental and, and Delta Northwest, and I think both of those have given us some good instruction as to what works and what, what doesn't work as well. And uh, we're going we're gonna to work real hard to make sure that integration is successful. Yeah. That's where the rubber meets the road now. Yep. I'm glad you left your successor something to I do. I did. He's got, got to have something to do. A little worried about that. Um, so what does a CEO have to do? You, you mentioned resilience as your, your doggedness as your personal characteristic earlier. What, what, else, what are the other characteristics of a good CEO? Uh, I think, uh, yeah, I really like something Warren Buffett once said, and some of you probably heard it. He said, uh, he said three things he looks for. Energy, intelligence, and integrity. But he said, the most important is integrity, because without that, they'll kill you with their energy and intelligence. <laughs> and I've always thought, that's, you know, that is spot on. You, you really have to hire people, and I would include the CEO in that category, mm -hmm. People who have, you know, you got to have drive. You've got to have, and you, ha you have to have a certain amount of intelligence, but you got to have a lot of drive because it takes a lot of energy. It is, it is really a 24-7 assignment, and, and the buck always stops with you, particularly in a job that is 
global in its nature and, um, you know, 80,000 people uh, doing high wire work every day. You have to have a lot of drive. But if you don't have integrity, you know, all of those things can be used for bad things. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we've seen it in industry. We've seen it in government. We've seen it everywhere. You, know, you, you see where people kind of go off the rails. And it's the most important thing. It may sound... Uh, it may sound like a little bit of a soapbox, but uh, that's, that's important, and it creates the tone at the company. Yeah. I guess it's also the job of the CEO to, to kind of build the integrity into the company. A and you know, I guess sometimes that's thought of as corporate social responsibility. How does, how does that happen? How does the CEO promote that? Well, I'm a strong believer in tone at the top, and I do think the tone that you set and what you say and what you do and what you don't say matters a whole lot because people are paying attention yeah. um, more than you think they are. And so tone at the top is really important. And then, you know, remember who you hire matters a lot mm -hmm. because they're setting the tone at the top of their mm -hmm. part of the food chain and, and, and onward down the organization. So you want to hire good people and, you know, always remember that turkeys hire turkeys. So it's... Um, I think tone, tone is important. Social responsibility, you know, I have a view on that, and uh, it may not be the view that everybody in this room has, so, you know, fair game on that. But I, I think that we all have a duty to be ethical and to behave in a way that is responsible to our, you know, our fellow citizens. So I believe that 100%. I, you know, I, I faith and forms a view on that, and I believe in, you know, the golden rule. So I sort of come back to that as mm -hmm. a principle for operating a business. But, um, but I also believe that uh, the best thing a business can do, and I think sometimes businesses get kind of confused about, you know, social good versus capitalism good. I happen to believe capitalism is really good and has done a really good job of raising living standards around the world for hundreds of millions of people. And I don't think we should ever be bashful about that. So I think as a, a leader in business, I think a lot about we need to be successful in producing a good product for our customers, which will produce a good outcome for our owners, which really importantly will produce security in jobs and hopefully growth in jobs. Because I think there's n almost nothing you can do better for your fellow man than to give them a meaningful job. And I think growth and jobs are worth a million social programs. Uh, you know, it's just you cannot do enough social programs to be as, as powerful as empowering a person with a job and a career. So, you know, that's my view. And so I, I think that, I say this to my kids, I think business is an important calling. And, uh, you know, most of those of you in this room, I think, have chosen that as a calling. And I think it's a very noble, uh, I think it's a very noble calling. And do it well, because people are counting on you. So we'll close. Best piece of advice you've been given? Uh, yeah, so the best piece of advice I've been given is, is uh, so you'll recognize this. Have a little more than you show and speak less than you know. Who knows where that comes from? Any English majors in here? At Shakespeare, that comes out of King Lear. It also comes out of George Strait. So I figure that <laughs> any time you can get, you know, you can get Shakespeare and George Strait saying the same thing, I think that's good. But I think, uh, in all seriousness, I, it comes to, back to humility. And I think, and business, um, uh, I don't care who you are, whether you're, you know, the guy tossing bags or you're the CEO, it's important to, uh, you know, remember your place in the universe. And I think it, it is important to be humble. And um, I think that can, uh, that, can, that can solve a lot of ills in business. So I, I do think that's, uh, I think that's really important. And for all of you, you know, I guess my advice to you would be, if you want to succeed, you got to work hard. You know, there's no substitute for hard work. I don't care whether you went to UT or, or uh, Harvard or, or Baylor or where you went to school. It's just uh, what your credentials are. It's all, that's, that's the ticket to get in the door. You know, the, how far you go will be, uh, will be predicated on how hard you work.
Thank you. We have a little while set aside now for questions and answers, and there are microphones in the aisles. So if you'd like, if you have a question, just line up by one of the two microphones, and we'll go back and forth and try to get to you as quickly as possible. We ready to go over here? Yeah, fire away. Hi. Hi. My name is Edwin Chan. I'm a third year student here at McCombs. Uh, my question is, as somebody who is going to the consulting industry, I care a lot about miles. And uh, Delta recently announced that they're changing their frequent flyer program from distance-based to revenue-based. Uh, I was wondering how long until Americans going to follow the suit or if Americans ever going to follow the suit. Well, now you know I can't answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very good question. Um, well, but how do you personally feel about yeah, this change? Uh, that would be answering the question. Um, <laughs> I will tell you, I, for those of you who don't know, Delta implemented a change in the frequent flyer policy whereby they reward miles based on how much you paid for the ticket. So if you paid $1,000 for a ticket, you get more miles than if you paid $300 for the t same ticket, even if it's to go from you know, Austin to LaGuardia. So some of you would probably say, you know, duh, right? So that kind of makes sense. You get rewarded based on how much you actually spend with the company. Um, so I think, um, I think what they did was interesting. And uh, I think there is economic logic for it. So I don't believe it has been matched in the industry yet. Um, but it is not without logic, let me put it that way. And uh, I think, you know, I think it's important to reward your best customers with your best rewards. Cool, thank you. And I hope that someday you're out, you're, you're one of our 10 million milers. I'm going to be based off Dow, so I'll be flying American. Yeah, good. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. Over here with the next question. Yes. There is, there is actually such thing as a 10 million miler on American Airlines. So is this, is this mic on? Go. No, it is. Um, so when you voted to put AMR into bankruptcy three years ago, I suppose, did you think that a merger with US Airways or somebody else was the likely end game, or did you realize that later in the end? Yeah, so we talked a little bit about this earlier, and I'll, I'll try to give you a succinct answer because it's a very complicated question. The answer is yes. Um, you know, I started with American when American was number one. I've always felt American Airlines, and with a name like American, we should always be number one. That's just the way I feel about the company. <clears throat> so um, the others, over the course of the last decade, the others had both gone through bankruptcies but also merged. So when we were in you know, end of 2011, a little over two years ago, um, you know, the company was really in bad shape. And um, when we filed for bankruptcy, our stock was basically worthless. Our bonds were trading 20 cents on the dollar. Like I said, the company was losing a lot of money. But the big problem was our biggest competitors had gotten their cost competitive, they had gotten their balance sheet strong, and they had merged into these behemoths. So Delta and United were bigger than we were. So yeah, it was really obvious to me. We needed to do a lot of things fast. We needed to restructure. We needed to renew, which was what that airplane deal was all about. And we needed to merge. But the sequencing was really important because that would dictate the value creation that went to our owners, right? So if we tried to do a deal when we were weak, we would have gotten a terrible deal. So. Uh, before we filed for restructuring uh, in November of 11, back in the summer of 11, I had approached uh, my counterpart at US Airways, a good friend of mine who started at American. And we talked about a merger. And this is all in the background of the merger, so it's all public. Um, and I approached him about that and suggested a merger could create a lot of value. But we had to, we at American had some problems to solve first. So we had to get our house in order. We had that conversation. We sort of agreed upon that. We put the company into restructuring. Shortly thereafter, some of the, those of you who may have followed this story, US Airways started agitating for a merger, publicly campaigning, which culminated in, to make a really long story short, it culminated in them making sort of conditional labor agreements with our unions 
And then putting a proposal in front of me that said, this is April of, that, of, of 2012, 50-50 ownership. U.S. Airways would own, shareholders would own 50 percent, our creditors would own 50 percent. Well, to that I said, number one, your labor deals with our unions aren't binding, so they don't make any sense. And number two, 50-50 doesn't make any sense because we're twice your size. Click. So that was the end of that conversation. And we said, okay, we're going to go back to getting our restructuring done so that we can demonstrate to the world the new Americans could be really successful and profitable and then go back to U.S. Airways and negotiate a deal that was more sensible. So cutting through a whole lot of back and forth and a whole lot of iteration involving unions, creditors committees, creditors, uh, our board, U.S. Airways, we negotiated a deal that was 72% American, 28% U.S. Airways, which I think is a good deal for both sides, but it wound up creating a whole lot of value for the American owners, and the American creditors got full recovery, 100% of their money back. And the old AMR shareholders, who are usually wiped out in a merger, are going to wind up getting about $12 billion, which is more than the market cap of the company ever was before it went into restructuring. So it's a, a really bizarre outcome, but it's because the sequencing was proper, and above all, it's because you know, 80,000 people in America ran a good airline throughout the restructuring. And you know, in the end, the value of a company is the value of the franchise, and the franchise was valuable, and, and we were able to demonstrate that. A long answer to your question, but that's how it came about. Thank you. Thanks. Back over here. Yes. Hi, my name is Jamal. I'm a junior. My name is Jamal. I'm a junior hey, at Jamal. UT, a uh, county major too, actually. Uh, so my question for you is, so my dad was an expatriate when I was in high school. So I lived in Bangkok when I was in high school and I went to a British school and I obtained a funny little British accent as well. Uh, <laughs> my question to you would be, could you talk about some of the things that you did in London whenever you were over there? Um, things that you did that you really enjoyed and that you miss being back in the States now, you and your wife? Oh, that's a good question. That's, so what, what, did, what did I miss from, uh, from living in London? We were there for two years. We go back a lot. And um, you know, some of you probably lived there or spent a lot of time over there. It's a great city. I love, I love the city of London. And um, uh, we lived just south of Hyde Park. And what I miss the most is every morning when I was in town, I would get up and run Hyde Park. And if, um, if I had a lecture time or maybe on a weekend, I would run from Hyde Park to Green Park to St. James, down the embankment, all the way down into the city, and then back up. And it was like, you know, it was like a history tour. And uh, I just love doing that. So I, I really love running in London. The weather's always perfect for it. So that's what I love about London, <laughs> more than anything. I actually wrote a... Uh, you know, I'd, as, as CEO, I'd write the little in-flight magazine article. So you may see at the front of the CEO writes a letter. And, you know, sometimes you have a ghostwriter to help you with it, and sometimes I would actually put a lot of brain power into it. So I wrote one on running, my, combining my two passions, running and travel. And it was called Running Around the World or something. And I talked about all my favorite places to run. That one I just described as one of them. And uh, I just got such a deluge of response from people who, you know, like consultants who travel around the world, they always bring the running shoes and you know, take off and run uh, Retiro Park in Madrid. And they say, oh, that's my favorite place to run. And so it's a good way to sort of connect with your customers as well. Thank you. Thank you. I think that's the first good time question. I've ever heard London, weather, and perfect in the same sentence. If you're a runner, <laughs> okay. the temperature's always in that zone between you know, 40 and 70 or something like that. Yeah. Over here. Hello, my name is Miriam and I want to thank you for coming. My question has to do with the One World Alliance. I'm curious about like the dynamic of working with that, of being a leader of that. Could you elaborate on that, please? That's, that, that is a good question because, you know, while I'm the chairman of the One World Alliance, none of those people actually work for me. So, so you know, <clears throat> the other people on the board of One World Alliance are, you know, the CEO of IAG, who owns British Airways and, and uh, Iberia. You know, the CEO of Cathay Pacific, the CEO of Qantas, the CEO of all those airlines. And so it is a little bit of herding cats. So it's a bit of a, um, it, it's more of a diplomatic assignment uh, because you're trying to make good decisions. And above all, what we're trying to do is create uh, a product for our customers that works well. So you can fly on American, you can fly on BA, you can fly on 
Qantas, and you know that's pr produced a good outcome for, for our customers. But each of the individual airlines is trying to optimize its own, you know, its own network, its own profitability, and so sometimes there are conflicts that come into play, and uh, that is tricky. And so we actually have a voting structure in the One World Alliance, and it it is predicated on the size of the airline. So American is now the biggest, so we have the largest voting block, followed by IAG, who owns BA in Iberia. So there is a way to force a vote, and American would have an outsized um, uh, voting percentage. But you never really want to get to decisions that way, because if you do, then people, you know, somebody's unhappy. And so it's a little bit of, uh, it's, you know, a little bit of cajoling, a little bit of, you know, trying to iterate to the right answer and have people feel good about it. It's not easy, I will tell you that. And that's why, you know, you probably, if those of you fly in alliances, whether it's the good one, One World, or those other ones, um, <laughs> you know, you probably notice that there are some policies and procedures that don't feel like they're just perfectly optimized for the customers. And the reason is probably not that we're stupid, but that somebody has a different motivation and you're trying to line those things up as best you can and you, know, you haven't completely gotten there. I will say that uh, once you get to a joint venture like we did with British Airways in Iberia, so we, we basically pool all of our revenue on the Atlantic. So I don't, it doesn't make any difference to me whether you fly on an American plane or a BA plane because we're gonna put that revenue in a pot and split it up based on capacity. So that, allows you to more quickly optimize decisions. So you're not, you know, you're not trying to outsmart each other because, you know, it's all the same pot. And uh, that, that was how we got to, for those of you who are kind of airline junkies, full reciprocity on frequent flyer. So, you know, you can use your advantage miles to fly on BA across the Atlantic. You can use your executive club miles to fly on American across the Atlantic or anywhere either of the other airlines flies. We had a big food fight over that for years because we believe the Advantage program was so valuable that if we let BA's customers do that, then they might, you know, there, there would be value shift from American to BA. Once we aligned the economics, then, you know, we didn't have to have that food fight anymore. So it's getting better. And I think you'll see these alliances morph more into uh, uh, these joint ventures, which are effectively like, it's like a synthetic merger. And, uh, so you'll see more of that, I think. In fact, over time, I think you'll see actual mergers between these big international airlines. That's gonna come someday. Thank you. You're welcome. And back over here. Uh, my name is Montana Moore, and I'm a freshman at McCombs. And I know as a leader, you've had to make a lot of really tough decisions that not everyone is gonna be super happy with. Not everyone. Yeah, so <laughs> my question is, what are the strategies that you use in order to make like everyone feel like they're heard and to make those decisions go off smoothly and successfully? Well, I'll, I'll tell you the way I did it. Maybe it's not the best way, but it's the way I always thought about it. <coughs> so at the outset of this restructuring, as I described, we had to do a lot of hard things, but we had to do them in the context where all the pundits in the industry were saying Americans dead, right? So our stock was crushed, our debt was crushed. You know, we just had a lot of challenges to work through, and people were not saying kind things about the company. But I've got 80,000 employees who need to believe, right? Because they got to get up tomorrow morning and serve our customers. So, you know, on day one, in front of the cameras, I said, look, you know, we've got all these great things I described earlier. You know, the franchise, the Advantage program, the network, the new planes, 900 airplanes fly all over the world. This company is going to be a huge success once we go do what the others have done. And there were probably about five people that believed me when I said that. I said, you know, America's going to be hugely successful. Well, but somebody had to say it because everybody else was saying the opposite. But as we, and I believed it, and I think the facts bore that out, but as we began to make progress, then pe more and more people started believing. And uh, it was a little bit of a snowball effect. So by the time we got to the end of the restructuring, you know, we were taking a lot of new airplanes, delivering a lot of new products. The company was producing record profitability. We had negotiated this high wire merger inside the restructuring. And um, so once we got to that point, you know, a lot of people were believing. And 
you know, there is no surer protect, uh, uh, predictor of success than success itself. All right, you know, people, success breeds success and people start feeling good about the company. But it took sort of standing up, and I, I, not just me, but the whole leadership team to stand up in front of folks and say, this is what we're gonna do. Be very clear about it, and then go do it. Just, just deliver on it. And, um, and it, I'm not saying this was me or my, this was 80,000 people who did it, but they had to have something to believe in. The principle that, that, that I tried to follow, and I use these words a lot, and more importantly, I hope I use the action, was we're gonna do some things that are hard. And it's not going to benefit every, everybody. But the principle we're going to use is we're going to, we're going to try to do that which creates the best outcome for the most people. Right? So if we had done nothing, if we had done no restructuring, maybe we wouldn't have to you know, outsource our baggage service in Omaha to a lower cost provider. OK, we, no restructuring. Our company would have gone completely off the cliff, and 80,000 jobs would have been at risk. So we had to do a lot of things. But if we did them right, we did them wisely, and we described them to all of our constituents as we, as we did them, and then we focused on building a bigger, better company, the outcome was gonna be great for you know, what is now 110,000 people. So, but there were some moments there where I tell you it was rocky. It was pretty rocky. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, well, thank you all. It's always great to be at UT. It's a, it's a wonderful place. It's a gift to all of you to be here, particularly on a day like this. It's mm -hmm. such a great, uh, great university. Thank you all for having me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dean Platt and Mr. Horton. Thank you for taking the time out of your schedule today to speak with our students. I know that we will be able to take the lessons that you taught us today and apply them into our own lives. As a token of our appreciation, the Undergraduate Business Council would like to present Mr. Horton with this personalized Stetson Cowboy hat in recognition of your participation in the VIP Distinguished Speaker Series. Thank you. That is fantastic. Thank you so much for that. With the hat. Yes, sir. Absolutely. I really appreciate that. That is so great. <laughs> How about this? <laughs> Thanks. I appreciate it.